Good evening, everybody. It looks like our um, looks like our guest pace of entering the meeting is slowing down significantly. So we'll go ahead and get started. I want to take a moment to thank Mrs. Komai of our Atlas board and uh, her son Aiden for hosting our meeting tonight. They uh, take the technical challenges away from us so that we can concentrate on the content, your questions and uh, the needs of your students. I uh, also just want to acknowledge that, um, just want to acknowledge that Ms. Reeser and Ms. Sheridan, who are our school board representatives, would like to be with us. And uh, they may be with us later on during the meeting, but right now they have um, another meeting going on with the board. So um, we certainly appreciate their service on the board. Speaking of that, I just want to point out school boards working really hard, school administration working really hard under the most austere circumstances I've certainly ever seen in my career and maybe in my lifetime. And I just want to acknowledge there aren't easy answers to this and there are certainly differing opinions about how to proceed. And I just, uh, I know many of you have spoken at the school board and I want to just thank you, those of you who've gone from the Dominion High School community to speak before the school board, I want to thank you for your sense of respect and decorum. I've been watching public comment at the meetings over the last several months and the decorum has gotten pretty bad in my opinion. And I just want to put out my request. I can't influence everybody across Loudoun County Public Schools, but I sure would like to make sure that when we speak before the board, if you choose to do that, that I just would ask you to make sure you show the highest degree of respect. And most importantly, because these are public servants who are trying to do the best they can to serve our students. Secondly, because we want you to be a fantastic uh, role model for our Titans and students all across Loudoun County Public Schools. I feel pretty good about how you've represented our community. I don't feel so great about how others have represented our community at large uh, before the board. And so for whatever it's worth, I would just ask that um, you always show us such a high degree of appreciation and respect that um, I just ask you to consider that if you decide that you need to speak before the board and you'd like to speak before the board, you're certainly entitled to do so. I just ask you to represent us well. And I'm really grateful to the many of you who've already done that. Tonight, as we get started, um, I want to start with a bell ringer just to activate our thinking about this topic. Um, over the course of the summer, we went through this process, of course, back in July of identifying our preferences for the first semester of the school year. At that time, first week of July, one out of three parents selected 100% distance learning for their Titan, and two out of three parents selected or defaulted to a hybrid form of learning for their Titan, which, of course, has not materialized for most learners. We've obviously, almost all of our students have been participating in distance learning 100% during this first semester. Just curious what you think that percentage might be at this point in time. And I'll just give you uh, some idea that about 15% of our community has voted, not everybody yet. Vote's probably the wrong word. They've made their selection known. If you don't mind humoring uh, yourselves and others, go ahead and put in the chat, if you would, what you think the percentage of parents choosing distance learning at this time. It was about 36% back in the summer. What do you think it is this time around? We'll just get started with a little conjecture on your part there. I see a 60, a 50, a 75. All right. Thanks for putting those conjectures in there. I'll be honest to say I was anticipating that it would be about the same and uh, maybe it will be, but at the moment with again, 15% of our decisions in, it's actually completely reversed. It's 64% of the parents who've responded so far selecting distance, 36% uh, choosing the hybrid model. And uh, with 85% of our student body to still choose, obviously a lot could change but that's where we stand at the moment. I wanna um, turn our attention at this time to our agenda. These are the topics we intend to cover tonight. Uh, the parent survey itself. Survey is probably a poor choice of words. It's really a decision on your part for your student. We're also gonna be talking about this 
hybrid instructional model because it has moved significantly since we were talking about it in the summer. And it's now defined as concurrent teaching. And we want to try to give you some insight about what that's going to look like and maybe how it compares to what's currently happening in the distance learning environment. We recognize that's one of the top two items on your mind. And the second one, of course, probably even more important is how are we going to handle logistics and how are we going to keep our students and our staff safe if there is a return to school. So that's on our list of agenda items. We're going to talk very briefly about extracurriculars. That's a pretty short conversation. There's a lot to say about it. It could be a meeting in and of itself, um, but we just want to make a couple of points about it that are really relevant to the decision you're about to make. Uh, the timeline of implementation and managing your expectations. I think we need to be honest with you about what to expect should you choose distance or learning environments. Being specific about our objectives, we want you to understand that Loudoun County Public Schools has now chosen a very particular form of a hybrid instructional model. There are many, many models across the country, even across the region that have been implemented we now have a very specific and clear picture about what our model looks like, and we want to be sure you understand how it's going to work. We want to manage your expectations about the in-person experience. In a sentence, we could say it's not going to be what kids are used to experiencing at school. It can't be under the current circumstances. We'll explain some of the reasons why. All of this leads up to our desire to help you make an informed decision regarding your students' participation in the hybrid model beginning on January 21st. And we want you to be able to use Parent View or a Google Form. I think we'll probably send out a Google Form tomorrow to just make it easier for you to make your selection. You'll be able to do it either way. Again, just to facilitate your participation in this process. And then lastly, we just want to remind you, we'll remind you several times throughout this conversation that the hybrid instructional model is only going to be implemented by Loudoun County Public Schools if it is safe to do so. And I'll just acknowledge as we uh, get started tonight that, uh, of course, Fairfax County earlier today announced a delay in their next phase, what they call stage five of implementation of their hybrid model. They put that on hold for a couple of weeks given current health conditions. So that we always have to bear in mind, we're only gonna be able to implement the hybrid model we're here to talk about that you might choose for your Titan if uh, locally we feel like uh, conditions are appropriate uh, from a safety standpoint for us to do so. I'm gonna go through this slide really, really quickly. Again, I just made that top point really important. We're gonna get students back to school as long as it's safe to do so because we wanna balance the physical and emotional well-being of your students, staff members, and families. Um, and I know the emotional well-being of many of our students are why there's so many folks in our community with strong feelings about getting their students back in the building. Um, we just have to balance that against the public health, um, the, the safety of the public of health. I'm sorry, the safety of the public. Uh, public health mitigation measures are essential to our success. So these measures that we talk about tonight that will be in place to support student and staff wellness, we will be counting upon you if you choose the hybrid model to make sure that your Titan is meeting those expectations and implementing our mitigation strategies. It's important for you to know, as I pointed out a moment ago, that concurrent teaching is the option for in-person learning. There is a single model that we will be using for this hybrid implementation. And um, it's important for you to know, no student will need to have a schedule change uh, regardless of their choice for 100% distance learning or hybrid plan. That's actually the primary reason why we've chosen this particular model over other available ones. We wanna be able to maintain your son or daughter's current schedule. That being said, that doesn't mean that you're student will be able to retain each of their teachers. That is an entirely different conversation. We're going to get to that much later in the presentation. I want to turn it over to David Edwards. He's the director of school counseling at Dominion. He's going to talk to you a little bit about this choice that you need to make. Uh, good evening. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the decision that you will need to be making in the next couple of days. LCPS has asked all 
uh, parents and guardians to make a selection for hybrid in-person or 100% learning instruction for the second semester. I just wanna reiterate that, that what we're doing is a choice. It's a decision that you need to make. This is not a vote to decide whether the whole school will participate in hybrid in-person or distance learning. This is a decision for how you want instruction delivered to your student. All parents should make a new decision for second semester, even if your preference has not changed. And this selection will be binding for the second semester. Uh, the survey window will close this Friday, November 20th. If at that time you do not make a decision, uh, your student will be defaulted to hybrid in-person learning. Now this is a, a difficult decision. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide. And there are uh, thousands of reasons why you might choose one decision over the other. However, we, we would like to advise you to consider these primary factors. Uh, first, the health of your student and the health of other family members who come in contact with your students. Uh, distance learning is difficult for many of our students' social and emotional well-being, so please uh, keep that in mind. Some of our students have been very successful in distance learning environments. Other students have very much struggled in the distance learning. So you may wanna take that into consideration. Also, we know that many of our families have very specific uh, childcare needs and resources. So that may also come into play with your decision. This time we wanna introduce Assistant Principal Jamie Braxton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edwards, for going over the choice that you're about to make, uh, parents. I'd like to turn it over to Assistant Principal Jamie Braxton, who's going to explain the hybrid instructional model. She'll be followed by our instructional facilitator for technology, Teresa Eastman, who's going to give you some specifics about what concurrent teaching looks like. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. The chart that I'm presenting right now kind of lays out three different groups of students. Starting at the top, if you take a look at group one, that's a hybrid group. And group two is also a hybrid group. The difference between those two groups is that group one would actually be in the building on Tuesday and Wednesday. And group two would be in the building on Thursday and Friday. The third group is our group of students who are distance learning and they would be at home all the time. So regardless of which class you're in, two thirds of the students would be asynchronous, I mean, would be at home or distance learning at any given time. And one third of the students would be in the classroom. So this represents one class, one group in the room and two thirds at home. A days are still blocks one, two, three, and four. They're still Tuesday and Thursday. And B days are five, six, seven, and eight on Wednesday and Friday. Mondays would remain asynchronous learning. As we get ready to transition to the actual concurrent teaching model, and again, Teresa Eastman is going to tell us a little bit about this. Just want to answer a question that came in late this afternoon about the school day. Our school schedule will need to change ever so slightly for all learners to align with more traditional beginning and end times at school. So the school day will officially begin at 915 and end at 403. And uh, we'll certainly publish a really specific and detailed schedule. I'm working on that with the other high school principals at tomorrow's principals meeting but the day will shift ever so slightly and it will be a full day of school for both distance and hybrid learners. Ms. Eastman, all yours. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm gonna review some characteristics of a concurrent teaching setting. The biggest takeaway from the snapshot is that students at home will access instruction through a Google Meet while students at school will use their Chromebooks much in the same way they were this time last year. Um, they'll use a learning management system. Last year it was Google Classroom. This year it's Schoology to access the resources. Um, they may take digital Cornell notes or follow an interactive Paradeck lesson. 
teachers may choose to display the meat or resources on the television depending on their lesson. Um, slide 11 is actually going to give us some of the moving parts that teachers could incorporate during synchronous or asynchronous teaching. Um, what we see listed here are some of the best practices for equitable blended learning environments. Dominion's been accustomed to providing digital friendly strategies for things like interventions or feedback prior even to the pandemic because we went one-to-one -one with the Chromebooks in 2018. So our staff and our students have continued to build capacity and get comfortable navigating digital resources on a variety of platforms. And to that point, something to keep in mind while looking at this list is since there is no one cookie cutter way to deliver concurrent instruction, uh, this is gonna look different depending on the course and any given day. So uh, we can actually go ahead and take a look at slide 12. There are lots of different ways that teachers are gonna be able to organize a concurrent class. Um, slide 12 is demonstrating one way that a block might be organized during concurrent teaching. The instructional facilitators are working with teachers before and after winter break to navigate and plan on using several different models. Um, this model blends whole group and small group and independent practice before it closes out with a whole group discussion. So each classroom is gonna be equipped with an additional microphone, and that's gonna allow the kids at home to follow with ease during a whole class activity. Um, other concurrent models incorporate workshops or hyperdocs or playlists. So the goal is still to provide an equitable interactive experience for both the distance and the hybrid students. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. It's fantastic to see such a great showing from our community. I'm Assistant Principal John Signorelli, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, what room setup will look like in this model. Next slide, please. So what you're seeing right now was the plan developed this summer when we were talking about returning to a hybrid model at the beginning of the school year. In this model, desks were eight feet apart and we were given room capacity based on square footage in certain rooms. Um, in this model, students next to each other in this, in this room would not be considered close contacts as they would be more than six feet apart from one another at all times and would never be within six feet of one another for more than 15 minutes. Now, as we're resurveying the community, um, the school boards made some decisions to potentially accommodate that. Next slide, please. Now, whenever possible, and again, looking at our numbers right now, that's gonna be possible most of the time to maintain that level of distancing within the classrooms. Um, if we were in a situation where significantly more families chose the hybrid option and we had to accommodate more students within the building, there would be times in which we would move um, to six feet of distancing between each desk. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a scenario in which all desks are placed six feet apart, um, aside from the teacher desk. The teacher desk is still eight feet from the students. So in this situation, the students who were in desks surrounding each other would be considered a close contacts if they were there for 15 minutes or more. Now, again, as, as often as possible, we'll maintain the eight foot separation between desks and only move to this closer distance in the event that we needed to accommodate more students in a classroom at any given time. Next slide, please. And I'm going to pass back to Brewer. All right, and so next thing we wanna talk a little bit about is answer a couple questions that have been coming through the chat here in regard to quarantine and isolations. And uh, let me talk about that first. Uh, it's important to note that if we're able to use the classroom configuration with eight feet apart desks, that a student who might become sick in the classroom is not a close contact with anybody else in the room. That's one of the reasons for the selection of that uh, classroom arrangement as our primary go-to. So it is potentially possible and likely that if a student became ill in a particular classroom, none of the other students or the teacher 
would uh, likely be a close contact and would not need to quarantine as a result of that. If, however, we have a lot more students choosing hybrid and we need to move to six feet between students, then uh, those those students, I'm sorry, six feet between student desks, we get within each foot, each student's six foot circle. And those students who are immediately adjacent to a student who becomes sick would need to quarantine. One of the questions that came up in the chat and was pre-populated into our questions over the past few days is, if my student is quarantined from school and is not able to attend, may my daughter, my son continue to participate from distance? And the answer of course is certainly they can, and uh, they, they would, if they're well enough to do so, right? If they're feeling well enough to do so, of course they can. The teacher at all times is expected to maintain eight feet of distance uh, from the class, from the students so that we're not putting that teacher in a position where she or he become a close contact of any of the students in the room. And there, therefore, a sick student in a particular classroom would not necessarily mean that this teacher would need to quarantine for a period of 14 days. You can see here that if a student, a non-symptomatic or a student who's not currently sick has been declared a close contact of a student in a classroom who is sick, they would be quarantined away from school for 14 days. Again, they become a distance learner during that period of 14 days. Um, I think we can go ahead and go to the next slide. And as we're doing that, I just wanna point out that uh, you, a lot of you have asked about teacher. How do we ensure that we keep the same teacher? I'm gonna come back to that much later in the presentation. I just wanna emphasize we're not changing anybody's schedule. It's not our intention to change a single student's schedule away from the teacher that they currently have. So um, in neither choice, the hybrid nor the distance learning model will guarantee that your child will be able to be taught by the same person during the second semester that they have been taught by during the first. But we're gonna come back to that. I know that's a huge question on your mind, but before we talk about that, we need to move into this realm and talk a little bit about safety measures, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Ms. Braxton to address those. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Um, beginning with the very basic things, of course, all the students and staff will be expected to wear masks in the building at all times. And um, there will be mask breaks scheduled throughout the day. We already discussed physical distancing and showed you some charts of sample classrooms. And just so you know, if a student exhibits any symptoms at all, there is a care room that is separate from our regular nurses clinic where they can um, receive the attention that they need. So basically sick in, in, in sick students and students who just need basic care from the nurse will be separated. Um, some more safety measures that are being put in place. Um, for every day that a student is scheduled to attend school, there will be a daily symptom questionnaire that has to be completed that gets emailed each morning and the staff has to do that as well. The students and staff who are currently in the building do that each morning. And we also do temperature checks upon our arrival. Every one of us has our temperature taken every day. Of course, we'll increase our opportunities for hand washing and emphasize respiratory etiquette. Um, how to cover your coughs and your sneezes. And we have strict cleaning and disinfecting protocols that are in place. So we'll be working with our student health services in case any uh, contact tracing is needed. And we are just about to begin our air, air filtration installation in each classroom. So we're actually adding an air filter to each classroom as well as upgrading the filters in our entire HVAC system. So a few of you had questions about the air filtration and actually we're doubling down our efforts by changing the filters and adding a system in every classroom. I'm about to introduce um, our, our third assistant principal to talk about lunch and other things of that nature outside the classroom, but still very relevant from a health standpoint. But Ms. Braxton, if you go, go back to the previous slide for just a second, 
Several of you asked about the middle point there, strict cleaning and disinfecting protocols are in place. There are two different scenarios that I just wanna highlight with you in full transparency. The guidance we're receiving here about this is that we're gonna clean high touch surfaces such as doors, uh, for example, handles and thing, door handles and things of that nature, stair rails and things like that. We're gonna be disinfecting them every, every couple of hours. Uh, as far as desks in classrooms, we're going to be disinfecting them thoroughly at night, but that's going to happen every 24 hours. It's important for us to point out the reason we've been given that advice. We've been given that advice because we have five minutes in between our class periods. That's not a lot of time to disinfect. More importantly, once the disinfectant is applied to a surface, human contact really shouldn't be made with that surface for 15 minutes for the well-being of the human coming in touch with that disinfectant. So um, that's why LCPS is advising us that the appropriate approach is to disinfect in the evenings. Moving on to the next slide, uh, again, Nicole Maldonado, another one of our assistant principals, she's gonna play a little tag on the next couple of slides with Ms. Braxton as we talk about some of the non-instructional but really important times that we need to keep your Titans safe. Ms. Maldonado. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Good evening, all. So when we talk about lunch, every class will attend one of four lunch shifts between 12.30 and 2.30 p.m. for hybrid and distance learners. That will be identified in the student's schedule early on. All students will eat lunch in the cafeteria, those who are in the building for hybrid, and the cafeteria will be set up for social or for physical distancing. So we will definitely have um, locations where students can sit, and then we will label off the locations where students cannot sit. So Ms. Braxton. Some of you had questions about the buses and transportation to and from school. Once again, school bus, everybody wears a mask on. Very few exceptions to that requirement. Buses have reduced capacity to make sure that we can distance the students while they're riding. So whenever it's possible, students will be seated in every other row. And at the very least, one student per row. Um, sometimes if the bus is too full, we'll have to do what we call a double run, which means the bus takes the route, brings the load to the school, and then it goes back and runs the very same route to get the rest of the students. Uh, bus transportation information will once again be available through parent view. And if we can't get the students seated in every other row, then at the very least, we want to make sure there's only one student in a seat. Ms. Maldonado. Thank you, Ms. Braxton. So here we'll talk about restroom and locker use. We will, will encourage students to use the restroom during class rather than in the hallway during past time. That's to avoid large numbers of students using the restrooms at one time. Teachers will use e-hall pass to manage restroom use. Dominion has, is used to using this in the past, so this is not new. And then locker rooms will not be in use during this time. Thank you. Before we move on to our last three topics, I do want to just respond to some of the uh, some of the chat questions that you have put in there that maybe we need to be more clear about. One is, you know, we're going to be disinfecting desks and classrooms once per 24 hour period of time, because again, there are cautions about student contact with the disinfectant. And uh, we, we don't want to endanger students long-term well-being by, you know, cleaning their desk and then having them sit and have extensive period after period, three times a day, contact with the disinfectant. Uh, we will be disinfecting, of course, cafeteria tables in between each lunch shift. That's a must. And stu certainly students can bring uh, their own, uh, sanit within reason, can bring their own um, sanitizers and things of that nature to clean their workstation, to uh, clean their hands and things of that nature. Uh, so if they want to do that, they can. We um, have had a lot of questions about uh, if, uh, but let me go on, I'm sorry, let me go on to, uh, uh, let me talk about hallways for just a second. We're going to go on some scouting missions and watch some other schools in action who've already implemented our uh, instructional model. 
and we're going to send a team of people to those locations to check out the health mitigation strategies that they're using. The early routine, the early returns that we've heard from other people's scouting missions is that the hallways are not a particular challenge in a building that is, is designed like ours. Uh, I know many of you attended Mr. Catone's uh, town hall last Thursday, and uh, he indicated that at Seneca Ridge, they'll be implementing some one-way hallway uh, plans, and that's really necessary at Seneca Ridge for a couple of reasons. One is narrower hallways, and more importantly, the house model uh, obviously creates a, a totally different dynamic than rectangular hallways like we have at Dominion High School. It's not our intention at the present time to try to stagger dismissal from class time or to implement one-way halls. We will be closing the bathrooms because that's where lots of students tend to go and gather during a class change. Essentially with five minute class change, our strategy really is, and again, we're gonna scout this out. We, we will reconsider this if we need to, but we want students to keep moving. Remember the definition of a close contact in other words, a person who is at, at risk to transmit COVID-19 to another person is sustained contact within a six foot circle. And during those class changes, obviously many students are going to be within other students six foot circle, but only for seconds at a time if we keep moving. So that is our current plan right now, but we will scout that out carefully and make sure we're utilizing best practices. Uh, let's see, we will um, move on now to extracurriculars, and uh, we're going to be really brief about this. All students, this is so important. This is the most important thing we want to say. All students have access to the extracurricular program, whether they choose to be hybrid learners or whether they choose to be distance learners. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Our athletic programs have uh, begun in earnest to prepare for our winter season, which starts in about three weeks. And um, we are quite hopeful in spite of the governor's orders uh, to back us up a little bit in our progression and uh, minimize the size of public gatherings across the Commonwealth. That does not apply to any of our plans to uh, implement our athletic season across the Commonwealth or their school division, nor does it interfere with our plans to implement hybrid learning. Uh, so we do plan to move ahead. We have athletes coming in the building right now with very strict uh, protocols. Their temperature is checked. They complete a health screening before they come. Uh, we work very hard to keep them uh, distance from other athletes. At some point, obviously, if you're a wrestler or basketball player, you're gonna come into close contact with other athletes. So a big, big health mitigation strategy is to make sure only healthy athletes are showing up to practices and games. Um, Another example, our band and our color guard are beginning to, pre to uh, rehearse in person, in the building, in small groups and sectionals. And I'm really excited. We had uh, some fall virtual one act plays two weeks ago. They were dynamic. We're uh, Doc Worth, our directors, gearing up to get us ready to do a radio play where we will be able to feature both in-person actors on the stage, socially distanced, as well as uh, virtual actors who will be able to perform right alongside of them in a hybrid type of presentation. We can do that with a radio play. It's going to be a really exciting production. Can't wait to see it. So extracurricular activities are going to be alive and well and a really important way for students to connect uh, with one another and to be engaged in their school experience. Um, it's important to know that uh, uh, we don't have buses, activity buses that bring students to school for these activities. That's going to be a little bit more of a challenge than usual. LCPS simply cannot do that, uh, given the circumstances of needing to transport, you know, just 13 kids on a bus. And uh, again, the health mitigation expectations are going to be critical to success in the extracurricular setting. Ms. Braxton's taking us to the next slide there just before I got finished. Sorry about that, Ms. Braxton. I'm not going to say much about this slide except to say our amended sports season here in the Virginia High School League kicks off on December 7th. And um, at this time, especially given the governor's order of gatherings of 25 people or less, we will not be permitting spectators during winter sports games. I know the board has started to hear some feedback from community members about wanting to be at athletic contests 
that's just not a good idea at this point in time. We're, as school administrators, our athletic department, our, our, our athletic trainers, we're going to be working really, really hard to keep the athletes, officials, and coaches safe on the court, in the pool. And uh, right now, we need to focus on that and not the spectator experience. Uh, spectators can watch our games in the gymnasium and on our main stadium field once we get outside. You can watch these via live stream through the National Federation of High School Network. There is a subscription cost. It's $11 per month, which is a huge bargain compared to paying $6 per contest. I know it's disappointing not to be able to see your Titans compete in person, but we want to salvage these athletic seasons. Our students have missed so much already. All right, next slide, Ms. Braxton, if you don't mind. Timeline of implementation. I think this is uh, Mr. Edwards, back to Mr. Edwards here. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about managing expectations and we're gonna try to tidy up the many questions that you have. Mr. Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, parents and, and guardians will have up until this Friday to make their selection to in-person hybrid learning or distance learning. Um, after winter break, all secondary teachers were, are going to return to the classroom to conduct distance learning and prepare for the current, uh, prepare for concurrent and hybrid distance learning model instructions. On January, on January 21st, stage four implementation of concurrent learning will, will commence. Uh, students will be coming back into the building and uh, other students will be learning at distance. Uh, so that's the timeline. It's pretty simple. Thank you very much. All right, and I just have, I think, two or three slides left here. There are some special considerations, some things that you want to think about. Um, assignments to whether or not, if you choose hybrid for your uh, Titan, your Titan will be assigned to Tuesday, Wednesday to be in school or Thursday, Friday to be in school. While we will probably start with an alphabetical approach, uh, a random alphabetical approach, we will not be able to do this strictly alphabetically. Several factors will need to be considered. The most important one is we need to balance class sizes so that we, if at all possible, have an eight foot distance between each of our desks and a complete six foot circle around each student in the classroom. So we're going to be assigning your Titan to a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday, Friday, so that we can maintain those balanced class sizes across 765 different sections of courses. So as you can imagine, that gets way beyond a simple breakdown somewhere around Katie Lawn. She's the middle learner of our 1500 Titans right now. So um, we'll be adjusting those. We will probably start with Tuesday, Wednesdays, We'll start with primarily A through L's and primarily M through Z's on Thursdays and Fridays, but it will not strictly go that way. I'm pretty sure that's how Mr. Cotone is going to do it at Seneca Ridge as well. He and I will be talking. We talk every Wednesday for an extended period of time so we can stay calibrated and we will certainly stay in touch about that. We'll make every effort if you've asked us to, to keep your middle school and high school student in the same group if you desire that. Maybe you don't. There might be reasons why you prefer a different approach. Um, we recognize that those of you who have freshmen and you're asking them to come back in the building, that many of them have never been in our building. And we have had numerous requests for a freshman orientation option for them. That makes a lot of sense to us. So with strict health mitigation protocols in place, we will make arrangements for that to happen much like uh, led much like we would have done back in August under the leadership of our link leaders who's uh, who are comfortable coming in the building and their parents are as well. Don't forget to make your choice using parent view. Uh, you were sent uh, information about this from Loudoun County Public Schools last Wednesday morning. Uh, you can go into parent view and make this choice. Uh, I also intend, frankly, to get a ConnectEd email out to you tomorrow with a Google form. If you prefer to just tell us through the Google form which one you, uh, which choice you want to make, we'll make that we'll make that selection for you. Uh, let's see. I think this next one is our last slide, uh, and I just want to manage expectations. I think this might be one of the most important slides on the list. I just want to point out that um, this is not school. What we're talking about here in the hybrid model 
it's not school as we once knew it. I, I want to acknowledge that right up front. Students are going to be socially distanced significantly. They're obviously not going to be able to gather and congregate in the hallway in between classes before and after school. At lunchtime, they'll be able to get that mask break that they need. They will be quite a, quite a distance from one another, at least six feet away from the nearest person. They'll be able to choose their own seats. They'll be able to talk to their friends while they're in lunch, uh, but it won't quite be the same, that's for sure. It's really not going to be the same from an instructional standpoint. I saw in the chat earlier some concerns about our ability to equally engage students who are learning from distance and those who are in the classroom. Our staff, they have blown me away with their uh, the skill set that they have developed over the past six or seven months to engage their students from distance. I have a tremendous amount of confidence in their ability to engage our distance learners. And let me remind you, as Ms. Braxton pointed out, at any given time, two thirds, two of our three groups are going to be learning from distance. It's not an option for us to not do a really good job engaging the students who are not in the room. We've got to do that and we have to do it well. But the truth of the matter is that's an overwhelmingly difficult task. And that means that the same level of attention and personalization that students are used to experiencing within a classroom setting is going to be compromised in this model. It has to be. Now, you probably, the next question that I want to address is this plan, concurrent teaching, was not on the table over the summer. Uh, we, as instructional leaders in Loudoun County Public Schools, had rejected this plan. And we rejected it because of the following fact. This is going to be a tremendously, tremendously uh, challenging instructional model for our teachers to implement. Uh, engaging students who are not in the room and those who are in the room, it's going to be the professional challenge of a lifetime, of a career. Um, I, I, I want to assure you that at the very least, our teachers can do the types of things that they're doing right now from distance and get a lot of success for students who are learning from distance. Of course, everybody's doing that right now and an enhanced experience for those in the classroom. But I'd be I'd be pulling your leg if I told you it was going to be as engaging uh, as uh, under these circumstances as it we're used to. It's certainly not going to be that. This plan, by the way, I just want to say, you know, what changed? I heard this in the meeting that Mr. Catone led last week. What changed about this is very simple. At the high school level, we cannot divide the student body into distance learners and uh, in-person learners and build a master schedule that works for our kids. Not only would we have thousands of schedule changes, every student having a massive overhaul to her or his schedule, we would also have thousands of students who would not be able to remain in all the classes that they're currently taking. This is the pathway. Uh, it's the pathway that allows us to provide direct instruction to every student four days a week and not have to have schedule changes. Now, the big question that you've asked here, uh, I wanna skip over this next bullet point for just a second and say this last bullet point, the advantage of the hybrid model for sure is that your student is going to get some human contact that they're not currently getting with other students and with the teacher in the room, that's for sure. But it's important to note that significant screen time is still going to be necessary. As Ms. Eastman pointed out a couple of, uh, about a half an hour ago, you know, our students have had the Chromebooks for two full years before this. Utilizing the Chromebook on a regular basis within the school setting is pretty common. And it's gonna need to be even more common under these circumstances. So I just caution you about making the decision to opt for hybrid thinking it's going to reduce your students screen time significantly. I doubt it will do that. It probably will decrease it to some extent. Um, but again, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to be relying heavily upon the learning management system and those Chromebooks to give our students an opportunity to have equitable platforms for learning. For example, equitable resources when they take assessments, the same types of assessments when they are assessed 
the same types of learning experiences. All right, question of the evening, it seems, is why, why might my student have a different teacher second semester than first semester? Here is the moment of brutal reality for you. Uh, teachers, just like you, are going to need, you, you are considering one of the huge factors you're considering tonight and this week as you decide whether or not you want your Titan to return to school two days a week for in-person learning are the health risks. Our teachers have to evaluate those same health risks. And in many respects, they have more complicated uh, circumstances to consider uh, than our students do. Not in all cases, but in many. It's important for you to know that on our staff of 160, 170 people, 135 that are teaching our kids on a regular basis, there are going to be at least a dozen, maybe as many as two dozen, who are simply not going to be able to return to the building for health reasons. This is a complicated formula and set of circumstances that Loudoun County Public Schools will be utilizing to determine how those how students in that situation will be taught. In some of those situations, your teacher will, your student's teacher is going to qualify for a distance learning teaching assignment in spite of the fact that she has students in her classroom who need her to be present. In those limited number of circumstances, Loudoun County Public Schools will hire a proctor and that's the specific word that we're using. It's not a current employee like a teacher assistant. It's not really a substitute because this is a person who will be hired for the specific purpose of being in, let's say, the Russian classroom. We don't teach Russian. I just don't want to pick something that's for real and get any rumors started. Um, that classroom where the teacher is on distance, uh, is teaching from distance, there'll be a proctor in the room to facilitate supervision of the students who are in the classroom. I want to be honest about that. That's not different than what your son or daughter is experiencing right now. I get that. I understand that. But it does at least maintain the continuity of learning for your Titan with the teacher that they've already grown accustomed to. There is a second, and I anticipate much greater subset of our teachers who will not be able to qualify for a distance learning assignment. They instead will need to take family medical leave to protect um, their health interests and the health interests of their family. In those situations, we're going to need to identify long-term substitutes who are going to teach in their place. My current estimate would be, we will have a dozen teachers who will need to uh, take that approach. I'm being honest with you about that out of my respect for you and my care for you and your students. It will not matter whether you choose hybrid or whether you choose distance learning. These teachers have significant health needs within their family circle that they have to prioritize. Many of them are heart wrenched about the difficult choice that they're making ahead of them, but they know they have to do the right thing for family and balance that with the right thing for your students. So I just want to predict, I'll make a prediction, and it won't be true in every case, but I would predict that just about every student in our school runs the potential of having at least one situation where there's a proctor in their room while their teacher teaches from distance, or there is a long-term substitute who's going to be hired to teach in place of their teacher who is going to need to take leave. It's important for you to know that, again, that decision isn't gonna come down to whether or not, you can't avoid that whether you choose hybrid or whether you choose distance. That's just teachers needing to care for their personal and familial needs. So uh, that's where we stand from that standpoint. I wanna turn to a few other questions that we have. Obviously the chat's been blowing up as I've been making these final comments and I haven't been able to follow it. So, um, I'll turn it over to some assistant principals, and I'm going to go back to uh, APs, Ms. Eastman and Mr. Edwards, 
I'm going to go back to the document of pre-populated questions and ask a few. Um, so if some of you can jump in and begin to address some of the things you see in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, we try to keep up with some of them um, as you were speaking. Uh, again, there hasn't been any discussion yet of um, sharing resources between schools. So for instance, if you were in a singleton, and in that case, we need to find a long-term sub, there's no guarantee that you'd be able to, the student would be able to take that class along with another student. And we also haven't heard anything about the percentage of students selecting the hybrid model as to whether or not that's going to inhibit us from moving forward. And again, the selection may vary widely by community as well. Um, and again, as this um, information is, we can't necessarily share ahead of time, um, you know, specific teacher preferences, which you know has to be frustrating because that may, would potentially have a, an impact on your decision, but that's, that's their, not something that we're gonna be at liberty to share. And if I could just point out too, to be really clear, um, teachers only option to say, I don't prefer to teach under these circumstances is to take voluntary leave without pay. So I don't expect a lot of our teachers to do that. This is not really a matter of teacher uh, preferring not to teach under these circumstances. The teachers who will need to be out of the building are doing this because they have significant health risks in their immediate circle of themselves or people that they care for. So I just want to send a really strong message that teachers, this is weighing on their souls heavily because they've come into this business, of course, of course to work with and rub shoulders with and be present with your sons and daughters. And uh, so it's heart wrenching for them to make that decision. But this is not anybody's fault. It's a situation of circumstances and, and we've got to do the best that we can to keep them safe and provide the best educational opportunity for your students. Uh, one prevalent question, I think, during the chat and in the, um, in, the, in the Google form that we sent out in advance is, what if my, I select distance learning for my student and conditions, like, for example, the emergences of these vaccines makes it safe for my student to return to school some point during the second semester? Can my student do that? The answer is no. This is a binding decision when it comes to making a choice to keep your son or daughter at home for distance learning. Conversely, if, you're, if you choose hybrid learning model, I'm not trying to encourage this approach, but surely if you choose the hybrid learning model and circumstances change between now and the end of the year, for a lot of different reasons, including the health of your family or the health of your Titan, and it becomes obvious that um, your student attending in-person learning is not the best choice. You obviously will be able to allow your student to stay home and learn from distance. And again, we don't want to encourage that approach, but um, you know, that's, that's kind of a one-way door. If you choose hybrid and distance ends up being necessary, of course we can accommodate that. If you choose distance now and you later regret that and want your student to return in person, we can't accommodate those choices because of the complexity of the scheduling process we're about to go through in trying to make sure we uphold the health mitigation expectations that our school board has outlined for us. And Dr. Brad, I think we should just clarify, um, you and your family are choosing now between 100% um, distance learning and the hybrid model. Teachers don't, don't have that choice. So I, I, I wanna make sure we're not communicating to you that teachers get to pick one way or the other. That's not the case. So we're gonna be asking our staff in full to be coming back on January 4th in preparation for in-person learning on January 21st. So we're asking all teachers to come back. Um, some teachers have priority status and therefore will be teaching from home. That's a very, very, very small number of teachers. And then some teachers may choose another option in which they take leave. So again, we're asking all, all teachers are being asked to return and a very, very small number have priority status and will be teaching from home and others who, others may choose another option, but that option is some form of leave. 
So again, teachers don't have necessarily a choice whether to choose to teach from distance or to teach in person. We're asking all teachers, the entire staff to return on January 4th um, and very, very small number that have a priority status uh, will be teaching from home. Ms. Maldonado, Mr. Edwards, Ms. Braxton, do you see we've got time for maybe one or two more questions? We are going to shift over to our Spanish version of the meeting here in just a couple of minutes. Obviously, we got a lot of parents who we want to support in that meeting as well. We really appreciate you all coming tonight. Do we have a question or two more that really, really need an answer tonight? Several people asked if we knew, to, knew which teachers would or would not be in the building. And the simple answer to that is no. They have to um, take care of that matter through the human resources department. So we don't have all of those answers, no. And, and again, I wouldn't let that affect your decision because again, that teacher won't be there in person or from distance in most cases it'll be a long-term sub. In a few cases, again, it will make a slight difference, uh, but that's a much smaller number. So mass breaks, you know, we're, we're wrestling with that and struggling with it. Mass breaks will be uh, definitely during that lunch block, uh, but other times of day, mass breaks are gonna be tough to come by for sure. Ms. Maldonado, Mr. Edwards, Ms. Eastman, you see one more we can address before we go? What about parking passes, Dr. Brewer? A few people asked about that. I have not heard anything about parking passes, um, it, it, except at the beginning of the year, the fee was waived for the first semester. And I'm going to be advocating for my role as principal uh, very hard that we not have a, a fee for parking for so many reasons. And um, let me just point out two, two things from a logistical standpoint to keep us safe. I'm gonna be asking parents whose students are driving, I'm going to be asking for your deepest consideration not to carpool. Let your student drive herself, himself, and the siblings, but not the whole neighborhood. It's just not safe to do that. And uh, secondly, we're going to need to cut off our past practices of having lunch dropped off for our students. We're not going to allow parents, Uber Eats, or anybody to do that because we, we simply need to significantly limit the traffic in the front door under these circumstances. So we appreciate your cooperation with that. And um, we hope you have a fantastic evening. Thank you so much and go Titans.